Hello and welcome back to Widowed AF, where every widow has a story. I'm your host, Rosie Gilmoss, and joining me today to talk about love and loss is the lovely Nico Lloyd. Welcome, Nico. Hello. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Now, you and I have known each other via Way, which is Widowed and Young, for quite some time now, haven't we? Yes, yes. Uh, it's where quite a lot of our sort of tribe members meet. Um, and it, 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 you sort of stay in touch with each other via the wonders of social media and way groups. And it's been very nice to sort of feel a part of your life. And I'm very much looking forward to kind of sitting and listening to your story all the way through, actually. Thank you. Thank you. On that trip in Somerset, you were, weren't you? No, I was in Tenerife. We met in Tenerife. Tenerife, the- that's it. I knew I'd been on some trip with you. Yeah. No, so we actually met in Tenerife and we were kind of like stylized twins because we had a lot of similar jewellery and I remember we were like, oh my God, we've got like really similar tastes. Yeah, I remember. I do remember this. I sort of felt like you're my Kent kindred spirit, yeah. I love that. I love to be your Kent kindred spirit. How gorgeous. Right, so let's get down to business, Nico. What brings you to this club? You'd like the opportunity to tell your story. Yes. So um, my uh, husband died in 2017 um, after being diagnosed with uh, brain cancer in, um, it was actually uh, 2014. So in the May bank holiday of um, 2014, which is just gone, which is quite bizarre thinking back. I was going to say it's quite near a quite important date for you. You're very brave to do it. Close. Yeah, yeah. It's weird because actually what reminds me of it is the bluebells because the morning that kind of our lives changed, we'd gone to a bluebell wood and strangely at the weekend I was at a bluebell wood and I thought, wow, this is, you know, it's actually nine years ago now, which is so strange. But yes, so um, basically it was a Sunday on a bank holiday. Uh, I had or have two children that, uh, that at the time were three and five. Um, and Mark, my partner, had been feeling a little unwell. Um, he'd been getting sort of headaches, but nothing that we were kind of too worried about. But that weekend, he'd had a particularly bad migraine, which was sort of unusual for him. Um, and he had noticed that over the par- previous weeks, his speech had started to go a little strange. So he was quite articulate and basically I just noticed that every now and then he was really struggling to sort of find words for things so obviously there's always like reasons you can think this is you know you've got two young kids he had a very stressful job all of those kind of things but anyway on that Sunday he had um what was a a seizure huge seizure um I thought that he was having a stroke I was sort of getting the kids ready for bed and suddenly he sort of screamed up and I've obviously carried on the story uh, for a, a few seconds and just sort of went, oh, I'm trying everything's okay. Weirdly, the section in the story was, um, and he went to hospital because we were, we were reading a, a book called Ant and Bee. And it was about these, an ant and a bee that end up in hospital, weirdly. So it was quite bizarre. So I just sort of went downstairs, left my kids upstairs and yeah, found him. And I thought he's having, I could sort of see that he was having a seizure, but... I'd seen that stroke poster recently and I was like, oh, it must be a stroke. So I kind of phoned an ambulance and, you know, the kids then had obviously come down and they were like sitting on the stairs and um, and he kind of came round and he sort of then was able to talk and the ambulance arrived and they sort of did all the kind of test method, right, let's get you in. We think you may have had, had a, a sort of mini stroke or something. So... Next thing I know, I'm in an ambulance. Um, Mark's mum had popped over to look after the kids in an emergency. And yes, so we got to the hospital and they started to do the tests. And they sort of at first thought it could have been a a mini stroke. So they treated us as if it was that. So he was actually just given a tablet and sent home, which was quite bizarre. Um, So then, you know, uh, he then had a a scan scheduled for them. I think it was the next day, yes. Yeah. So he then went off, um, a family friend drove him there because I wanted to stay with the kids. He went off for this scan um, and 
you know, I, I've weirdly, I've still got the text messages where he sent me a text saying, oh, you know, they think it might be migraine. It might not be a stroke. So I was like, great. And then he'd obviously had the scan um, and came out and they said, you know, basically we found something quite significant on your brain and, and you've got, we think it's a brain tumour. So it kind of, that was it. And they gave him some um, anti-seizure medication because obviously what he had was a, was a seizure. Um, and then that was the beginning of, of a diagnosis of brain cancer, which, um, yeah. So basically with, with uh, the, the diagnosis, um, it took them a couple of days and then we were taken back into hospital and I went into the meeting and they kind of looked at the scans um, and there was a surgeon there and a Macmillan nurse there immediately. And um, he just, you know, looked and he said, look, you know, this is, I think this is a, a grade for uh, GI blastoma, which is sort of immediately the worst brain tumor you could possibly have because obviously there are different grades. And um, straight away said, you know, when we said how long, you know, Firstly, what can you do? And obviously he went into the fact that he wanted to try brain surgery. So we were like, okay, there's something. Um, and then, but he also said, but even with surgery, I would give you about 12 months to 18 months to live. So that was straight away. Because with, with that type of cancer, it's just, you know, it does cut, it does tend to come back. I mean, there are people that are very, very lucky, but I think it's, you know, something like one percent of people survive with it beyond about two years. Also, I I don't know. Don't actually hold me to that statistic, but it is a very low. <laughs> I won't. I won't. <laughs> um, so that was just massive. Obviously, I had a, a three-year-old and five-year-old at home, and our life was just you know totally changed in sort of a few days. So, um, but. So, so yeah, so that was, that's what brought me, um, that's the beginning of the story, I guess, because he did survive for quite a long time and actually. Well, I was going to say he smashed that target, didn't he? Yeah, totally did. And so I guess part of my story is that kind of living, knowing that the person that you love is going to die and how sort of beautiful in many ways that yeah. is to have that knowledge I suppose and the ability to actually really really take day at a time you know wake up in the morning we're alive you're alive you feel well enough to do something today wow let's you know live life so it was quite a beautiful few years and that's um you know, obviously things changed, obviously the more ill he got later down the line. But one of the things that sort of really struck me about that experience was sort of, it's quite remarkable living with someone that you know is going to die, but they, they're they not like gravely ill at that point, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I can't even begin to imagine living like this because as you say, he didn't appear at this point to be desperately ill which must be very different to living with somebody who is sort of end stage yes. and, and very, very poorly. So during this time, he um, presumably is able to carry on kind of fairly normally. Um, are the children, we didn't know they were very young, three and five, were they able to understand that daddy yeah. wasn't well? So what, what did you tell them at the time? He obviously had brain surgery within about three weeks of, of this kind of diagnosis. So they were immediately obviously told that he had to go to hospital to have this operation. Um, obviously, being the person I am, I'm always, like, reaching out for support. So I immediately contacted, like, you know, uh, the, near us, there's Daisy's Dream, which is a, a bereavement, a, well, a charity for families with very sick parents or bereaved. Um, children so it's kind of like you um they immediately were able to support me and the advice they gave me straight away was obviously age appropriate honesty you know so um straight away you know we had to tell them that you know daddy has something called brain cancer and explain what that was um that you know the doctors are doing everything they can to make sure that he can enjoy a quality of life but we never said to keep him alive like we were quite careful around the wording um and they took it 
you know, amazingly well. I guess they could, they had that conversation with their dad and mum. So I suppose that's, you know, they could see that he was okay. Obviously, once he had the surgery, he had this huge scar yeah. on his head where they, you know, cut into his sort of skull and everything. And so, you know, I think there was a period where he did look quite ill for a couple of weeks, I guess, yeah, after brain surgery. Um, I mean, they people recover remarkably quickly, which is, you know, it's astonishing. So, um, and then obviously he then had chemo and radiotherapy. So obviously that was a period of time where he was intermittently sort of bedridden. So he, um, so they did kind of, you know, obviously notice that. And then at the times where he felt okay, he was up and about and, you know, really quite normal. So um, I guess they rode the wave with us and we kept them sort of informed. And, you know, I guess just kept it open and you know I mean Mark cried in front of them on occasions they mm. cried with him you know I think we just kept it very real I guess I don't know it's hard to explain. So this is quite powerful what you're saying actually about the way that you dealt with this kind of life ending you know diagnosis um, but at the time life changing and the way that you included the children and made them feel part of it. I think that's a very powerful thing to do, actually, because they may not, you know, remember every detail of it, but they will know as they grow that they were involved. Now, at this point, you were told that he had um, 12 months to live. So after the surgery, have they given you the, the idea that you might have a bit longer? Or are you still kind of thinking that you're really under this tie, you know, this real yes, pressure so, I mean, of time obviously, with him? Obviously, um, yeah. It was, I mean, that was all a bit of a whirlwind. And I suppose our focus became very kind of minute to minute during that time. Um, but sort of when we first um, got introduced to the oncologist, she was very much like, right, okay, do you want to go on any holidays? Do you want to do this? We can kind of fit in, you know, after you've had your six weeks of radiotherapy, we can kind of fit in around this kind of schedule of what time you may have left. So that became sort of quite important in, you know, the way that we did things. Um, so, yes, I mean, you know, for after yeah. he'd had, he, he used to have monthly cycles of chemo. Um, for brain surgery, have it as a tablet um, because uh, it's, it's the only, for, yeah, it's the only form okay. of kind of, well, it's one of the forms of, um, cancer that really struggles to um, get treated because you've got to get through the blood brain barrier so it sort of gets a bit complicated um, basically there are only certain sort of tablets they can use um, so yes basically um, we were very aware that time was sort of running out but we also wanted to kind of give it its best shot so you know we did a lot of research and we did find a few people that had kind of survived longer than that kind of prediction so there was a little quite a lot of hope I, su I suppose but um, we we're also very aware that yeah. yeah that would run out at some point and hearing that the oncologist was trying to factor in time spent together as a family and doing things I think that shows a real human side and a compassion that well, yeah that is hear about it from medical professionals just simply because they don't always have the time and I think that's it means a lot, doesn't it, stuff like this? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, you know, she was, I mean, she became a friend to us. It was like, because we were visiting her every month and, you know, like you get to know these people. And, um, I mean, it was also strange because obviously Mark was in his early 40s and, you know, a lot of the people we were dealing with were that age, you know, like kind of at the height of their careers doing what they do and you know even the brain surgeon I think he was born the same year and he was just like he was like I'm gonna make you live as long as possible that there was this sort of you felt like you have this kind of super team and I guess it's the NHS at its best you know what yeah. I mean and that's some remarkable people and they yeah. would do they'd have met you and they'd met the children and they would be absolutely trying to squeeze as much time for you all as they possibly could yes course. Okay, so I am now going to ask you a little bit about when things started to deteriorate a little bit for Mark and how that's impacted on, obviously on him, but also on yourself, because that must be very difficult to watch. 
so we obviously, in that time, um, so obviously it took um, another year and he had a, another tumour grew. And uh, so it was Christmas 2016 and we'd just gone to the kids' school concert and then Mark immediately had to go and get his scan results. So we, uh, by this time, we're mm -hmm. having every three months these scan results. So it was like we used to live our life in like three-month bursts. So basically, he went for his scan um, Oh, I had picked the kids up from school because we, we sort of constantly divided and conquered in that way because it was like easier for me to be with them and then him to kind yeah. of deal with what he had to deal with. Um, and yeah, basically it was just before the Christmas holidays and we found out that it had come back. So um, we then had to spend Christmas pretending everything was okay. We actually decided not to give the kids that information because you know they still at that point said right we I think we're going to try another surgery so we knew in sort of the new year we, he'd have to have surgery but you know in the meantime let's just have a nice Christmas so we did and um Mark then had another surgery after Christmas and um strangely that then was very successful it was a lower grade brain tumor strangely because they caught it very very quickly and then he had another 12 months of monthly chemo. So then we had this kind of other um, time. So another year of him kind of being, I guess, stable. And then um, in the new year of 2017, we had this amazing um, still clear of it. So then we madly decided to have an extension done because he wanted the house to be kind of sellable if he ever died like he wanted me to be able to just put it on the market so we kind of got embroiled in this uh, extension and then we went to America to visit um, a friend that we'd met through this that um, worked for LucasArt uh, so we went to George Lucas's um, ranch in, in America and got to see all the Star Wars stuff and had the most amazing time and we and then in the May um, 2017, Mark woke up one morning and his leg wasn't working on his left side. We were like, oh, and maybe pulled a muscle. He went off to the GP. I went out that afternoon, came back, and he was like, I've got to go to hospital. So took him into hospital. And, yeah, that was the beginning of um, – the end, basically. So, yes. So, what happened was they found that he had two more tumours, um, and at that point, they were gonna they were gonna do uh, surgery again, and and uh, so they did. Um, but the surgery meant that he lost. Um, so, during surgery, because believe it or not, when you're actually having brain surgery, they talk to you, um, and the surgeon said. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other podcast, actually, on, like, the whole brain surgery thing, because it is absolutely remarkable. I mean, Mark was quite into his sci-fi. He was absolutely amazed by the fact that there was this sort of Google map of his head. Do you know what I yeah. mean? His brain. And every time he sort of, they touch some nerve, um, you know, he suddenly stopped talking or whatever. It's like this wow. amazing, it's just, you know, watching seeing your neuro pathways but anyway that's another thing but he um the surgeon during surgery sort of said I can take the rest of this tumor out but you may lose the use of your left leg and you know at the time Mark was like I'll oh, just rip it out you know what's a leg to <laughs> it's only my left leg but obviously that was massive um, so when he came round after surgery he'd lost the he'd lost the ability to use his left leg um and that, I guess, was the beginning of a really hard struggle of his gradual deterioration, which with brain cancer, it's, um, it's a strange one. You kind of start to just gradually lose the ability to control your body and your mind. And, and for that was very difficult to watch for both me and the kids because and the, his whole family and um, because he was a very articulate person and very humorous right till the very end. But to see someone gradually sort of uh, lose that, it, it was really hard. So he ended up in hospital um, from the May right up until the July. 
because they couldn't get him out without rehabilitating him properly. He then came home in the July and he um, was, you know, it was quite hard work looking after him because he was six foot four and, you know, to move someone that was six foot four was quite difficult. So I'd been taught how to kind of look after him and get him out of the bed. I had all this sort of equipment downstairs. And then he started to have seizures. And that's really when that kind of got really difficult for me. Um, so the whole July, it was the sort of summer holidays. And, um, you know, I was sort of, you just didn't know what was about to happen. And, you know, the kids were there and he'd suddenly have a huge seizure and it was hard to move him. Um, and I think at that point, it, yeah, it kind of, that's when we were told it's sort of palliative sort of care because they already were preparing us to that but you know at that point so we did have like carers that came in and stuff like that and kind of it felt like our family was sort of a family of lots of people coming in all the time and you know Mark's family were really helpful my family you know we had a, a lot of help but the seizures started to get quite bad and um I was given this thing where I injected him every time he had a seizure but he just went unconscious so if he was kind of like somewhere else in the house or something when it happened you know I then had to deal with this unconscious six point you know six foot five uh person so it was really that became very very difficult so in the end uh we then started to get help from the hospice they'd come around and it got so hard for me to move him to do anything that he uh, sort of I guess it was probably Towards the end of August, he just said to me, I just can't have you do this anymore. It's like, this is just so destroying for me to see you struggling. And I think I should go into the hospice. And I was like, I kind of agreed, you know, obviously upset, but kind of agreed because I felt really, um, it was it was really hard looking after two really young kids and um obviously dealing with all the medical things that you're suddenly having to deal with and just someone that hasn't got mobility it's it's really difficult and these seizures were just sort of making it really really difficult for me so um the, a, a bed at the hospice came up at the beginning of September um and obviously I mean it's it's strange I remember the evening that we had to tell the kids that he was going to the hospice um, and and I remember taking a selfie. Well, I've got like this selfie. Of, it's not a se uh, yeah a selfie of the four of us. Like it's like our last ever family photograph. But you could see that we've all been crying. Which you know I look at it now and I think, oh no, what do you do? You know what do you do with that? But it was a really sort of symbolic point. And and then what was really awful was it was the kids' first day at school. So my daughter was going to uh, the junior school. And my son was already in the junior school. So they're all dressed up in their uniforms. And the um, you didn't know what time the ambulance was going to come to come and get him to bring him to the hospice. And it was just as they were leaving for their first day of school. So I'm, I'm trying to take a photo of them in their hospital thing. And in the reflection, mm -hmm. you can see an ambulance man. Um, and it's just, it, yeah, the reflection of the cooker, you can see an ambulance man. And it, it was, and it was, my daughter was sort of crying a bit and I, you know, part of me was like, do you want to go? You don't have to go. And they were like, no, no, it's okay. We'll go. And I brought them to school. Um, and at the gate, you know, well, there were all these mums crying with their kids. And I'm looking at my kids thinking my son isn't even crying and he's just left his terminally ill father. And my daughter burst into tears, wiped her tears and went, no, it's all right. I'll do it. And she walked in and I just thought that is a strong lady. You know, and I, she has, both of them have such um, strength and, yeah, it was remarkable. But really, that was really sad. Um, well, I'm going to interject so, yeah. there and just say that I can see where she gets her strength from. Because what you have done here is you have, I feel quite emotional hearing it, is, you know, you have tried so desperately to create some semblance of normality on what is a very important day for children going back to school and, you know, joining juniors. Um, and you've managed to kind of create this normality and then at the school gates I, I can only imagine kind of I probably would have felt furious like what have you got to cry about it's just at school 
<laughs> you did sort of feel like that. And then, yeah, I know, but it's it's easy. But part of me just, you know, throughout this whole thing, I've had this feeling like it's all relative, isn't it? You can't be angry with someone who's the hardest thing they've got to deal with at that moment in time is that their kids are going into junior school. Do you know what I mean? That is big for them. And it's all, it's, it's all relative, isn't it? Is. It's like, but it's kind of comic. Oh well, yeah, it is an, it's entirely valid as well because, you know, your kids going to school is, is, is an emotional time. But without people knowing what's going on in your lives, it, you just feel like you've got this kind of glass wall between you and everybody else. You know, like, as you said, the worst thing they had to be upset about was their, you know, the child moving up in, in school. And for your family, you just said goodbye for the last time, you know, from the home. And I mean, watching him get into an ambulance and leave the family home, that must be a very powerful and emotive moment in this whole journey. Oh, definitely, definitely. And and it was weird because the older members of the family were like, if he goes in the hospice, he won't live. And it's like, he yeah. won't. Do you know what I mean? Well, no, that's yeah, going to happen. Good. Um, but it was so funny how people were like, don't let him go. Don't let him go. He'll go. And um, we, we kind of at that point knew that that was inevitable. But yes, it is. It's, um, it is a really weird thing. But when I then dropped the kids at school and then went straight to the hospice, which was, is about 20 minutes drive from my home. And honestly, as soon as I walked in there, I just thought, oh, this is the right place because, you know, you go in, he's there, he looked all comfortable. They were saying, what do you want to eat? And, you know, they were able to be so lovely and caring. And I was able to sit there and chat with him all afternoon with no, in, you know, interruptions. And it was just lovely. And... I felt so relieved to be, you know, and straight away someone comes and sees you and says, right, we've got a counsellor here at this, someone you want to see. I mean, they'd already given us some counselling sort of earlier on because they, a lot of hospices provide counselling, you know, as soon as you've had kind of a diagnosis, if they've got the availability. So we'd already at the very beginning had some. So I did recognise and know the place. Um, but yeah, it felt like just being welcomed by these sort of, yeah, loving arms. Can I ask you as well, whether it's changed your role? Because obviously you've had to go from his wife to essentially his carer and his nurse. And by him being cared for by yeah. the professional carers and nurses and palliative care team, were you able to then step back into a, a wife role? I mean, it's obviously not going to be the same wife role you had before, but I'm wondering whether that kind of lifted you back again. Yeah. Definitely. And able to just, yeah, be by his side. And yeah, it was, it was absolutely lovely. I mean, they do so many lovely things in the hospice to make sure that you get special time together. I mean, I was allowed to stay any time I wanted. Um, the kids, unfortunately, I mean, the hospice now actually has family rooms, but unfortunately at that time it wasn't possible to have the kids with us just because of like logistics, but they would come after school every day. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of, usually people are in a hospice for like two weeks. Um, he was actually there for quite a while. And, and at points there was talks of, because obviously for a healthy man, it, like healthy young man, really, it, all that was wrong was that he had this brain cancer. Well, I'm saying it all, but he's sort of, he, it, I mean, without being sort of horrible it takes a long time for your you to die you know which is um so he ended up being there nearly I think it was let me think September October yeah he was there wow. about six weeks um so we sort of became part of the sort of furniture and it and it was really bizarre as well because they were like people um in the hospice that there was one lady that came and brought us you know, you have all these volunteers and this lady brought a cup of tea and she was like, Mark, I remember yeah. he was a little boy. Um, that we kept on talking to people that were like from his past or it, I don't know, I guess in a community where there's a hospice, mm. it, it touches a lot of people, doesn't it? So you've sort of, I mean, it felt quite, um, yeah, it was quite a sort of bizarre experience. And um, the kids basically... In the gardens, they made this little sort of den um, that, I mean, it's probably, I, I don't think it's there because they've actually moved the hospice now, but um, they made a little den and all their cousins were coming to visit and they all sat in this den and they were kind of, 
they just kind of became part of it. You know, they were helping and they and, and they got them involved in stuff. And, you know, I was even doing their homework in the hospital. Um, you know, sitting there trying to teach Evan times tables, which, you know. Now, no. earlier you said that it was a very, I, I didn't expect to hear you say it, actually. It surprised me. And it was that it was very, very generous of spirit, I think, if you and shows your positivity is the way you describe knowing that he was going to die is almost like a gift because it created this very special time for you as a family and enabled you to. Now, do, yeah. I'm hearing this now, actually, as you talk about the hospice. And I, it's a very weird thing I've written down. It sounds like a special time. And it seems like a very strange thing to write about a period of time in a hospice. But it, it does. It sounds like you've created this community and this family which would have been very comforting both for Mark and yourself, but also obviously for the kids as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think that's what facing death as a sort of family um, kind of can be. Do you know what I mean? It's like, in a way, a natural part of life. I know, obviously, when it happens and how it happens cannot always be sort of predicted, but obviously death is a part of life and, you know, to do, go on that kind of journey together it is something that's a privilege it's a privilege to spend time with someone in their last weeks do you know what I mean the conversations we had all of that it's it is a privilege right that's made my eyes go a little bit I, <laughs> I don't, it's I'm just sorry. hearing you talk about it is it, I've not really heard it described in such a, a, a beautiful way that you know I think yeah I think I think it's very special how you've managed to to view this time together and it's um is it it's not lovely because your husband died but it is lovely the way that you how you reframed it and included everybody yeah I mean I I think um I guess as a widow it's a strange one because you know it's going to happen so I remember I think one of the biggest shocks for me was in my head, in the hospice, there was part of me that's almost like, oh, you know, what, what do I do next? I think I saw a widowed in young thing. I was like, oh, I'll definitely join them. And, you know, so there's the practical side of you that's like, almost like, right, how, how can I make this as palatable as possible when it happens? Do you know what I mean? And, um, and it, what shocked me the most, I guess, was when it did finally happen, I was so shocked. It was as if I had no preparation for it because... You still can never accept no. that when someone dies, they go and that is it. And it's like, even though mentally I was like, oh, you know, if I, I make sure I do loads of yoga and loads of this and, you know, I, I'll just, you know, relax for a year and, you know, just get the kids better and we'll all be fine. And then, you know, it, it's just not like that. And, and it was almost, you know, comical that when he died, I was like... <gasps> Oh my God, he's dead. And, you know, it was like, that was a massive shock. Um, and nothing prepared you for it. So although I was prepared, I guess um, I have, you know, he made videos for the kids. We could like write letters. There was a lot of kind of initial preparation that we did. Um, yeah, you realise you can't actually prepare for what happens when your partner dies. Like, it is just, yeah. It's still a shock. And although I knew it was going to happen, it was still a massive shock, like a kind of physical shock. Like, um, yeah, it was that. So that's one of the observations yeah. that I've realised is, I guess, you know, I often think about people that lose someone suddenly. And in some ways, I kind of, when you've, you've lived with it for a long time and you've got that preparation in some ways, but then when it happens, it's still a massive shock. So I don't know, you know, is there a good way to lose a husband? Probably not. So, yeah. It's something John and I have talked about, not necessarily, you know, we talk about our stories because Sarah died from cancer and Ben died very suddenly, which means that we have sort yeah. of both sides of this dynamic. And essentially the answer is no, because you either watch somebody you love deteriorate before your eyes, which is awful, or you get the horrible life-changing shock. And yeah, there isn't a good way. I, I very much wish I'd been able to say goodbye to him and tell him yeah. how much I loved him. But I am also very probably knew. He, he knew because, um, you know, thankfully we told each other a lot. But yeah, there just there isn't there is no, no good way. You just if you are able to you try and give them the best death that you can that they can have and 
it sounds very much like you did that for Mark. Um, yeah, but I still felt guilty. I still felt guilty that it wasn't the good enough death. So it must be ingrained in you that you feel some form of guilt. I think that's And for it. me, it was like, you know, it wasn't, what was it? I can't remember, but there was little things that I was like, oh, you know, I should have done this. And even my son, like, felt guilty that on the day that he died, he hadn't been there yet that day. Yet he'd been for six weeks, every single day, told him that he loved him, spoke to him, and he felt guilty that on that day he'd chosen to stay at his grandma's because he was tired. And and I, you know, had always, and I, now he doesn't feel that, but it was shocking, you know, that there must be something in us that needs to feel that, you know, because it's not right that someone dies, I guess, on some level. So you have to kind of play it out in some way. And I think you're always looking for a, a blame, and I don't necessarily mean blaming um, externally, but you're looking for reasons and oh, I, if only I had this, if only I had that. And, and as we've heard, the brain plays some very peculiar tricks on the fresh, very freshly bereaved. You know, you start to bargain. And, and I'm guessing that maybe your brain was trying to protect you a little bit, you know, that it, you kind of, even though you knew it was coming, you, your sort of self-protection instinct had kicked in and it wouldn't allow you to think about it the kind of magnitude of what was about to land. Um, can I ask who was with him at the end? So it was actually um, myself and his mother. So basically we, so the hospice sort of a week before said, sort of with end of life care, it, it's like, um, it's when you can't swallow your tablets, which always kind of freaked me. <laughs> um, they suddenly, you, there are certain things that you can't do. And suddenly that is when you know that death is sort of closer. And um, so I got there one morning on the Monday and he couldn't swallow his tablet. And I, I mean, I Googled all of this. So I was like, oh, end of life immediately. I knew exactly what was about sort of to happen. And um, so for that, pretty much from then on, um, I, we knew that it was about sort of five or six days. And what was happening was he was having quite a lot of seizures, like to the extent that it was getting to the point they wanted to put him on a driver, um, which sort of gives you like like a morphine and, and stuff to kind of really gently knock you out, really. But um, so we they can kind of choose when they do that, but he was getting more and more uncomfortable um, and he was needing more sort of, he wasn't in pain, he was just not enjoying having constant seizures and they were really struggling to kind of get them under control. Um, so we kind of had to, I guess, make a decision when he sort of, they sort of said, if we give him this, he's going to go unconscious. Um, and this was kind of halfway through the week. You know, does everyone want to come and speak? So we sort of made sure that the family could come in and to see him and the kids. And I mean, when he was going into being unconscious, the most remarkable thing happened was that the kids came in um, and he, he couldn't communicate, but he still, on a primitive level, reached out his arms to hug them and hold them. And he was going in and out. And the, the nurse said to me, that is his primitive reflexes that's all that's sort of left now and he was able to hug his children I mean I was just standing I just could it's not gorgeous. believe what I was seeing he was yeah sorry um, and <laughs> it, it was just beautiful absolutely beautiful that a father has that love for his own you know and he could sense them um coming into the room um and that he had that a bit with me but I guess I could see it also with his mother like and his sisters and it was quite beautiful. I mean, I was sort of laughing because he had all these people around him. He had to, like his mother, his sisters, you know, like what a way to die. Like you've got all these people like surrounding you like this. It was beautiful. So the actual day that he died, like we've all been in and out and the kids carried on coming every day, but they couldn't stay there for too long. I mean, they were out playing in the garden there, but it was quite difficult because he was breathing very heavily and it was quite oppressive in the room. It was, um, but this went on for like, like two days of like just, and myself and um, his mum stayed overnight. And so we stayed overnight that 
for two nights, I think, we were kind of vigil round him. And, yeah, it, it was us that were there. And he died, like, in the kind of morning on the Sunday, the 8th of October 2017. And um, I, it was quite funny. His, his mum went out of the room and I was like, Mark, you can go now. You know, you can go now. And I think, you know, part of him must have just been going, oh, my God, the two of us, we were like – getting so, sort of, we were trying to be calm, but it was like a really difficult thing to sit through, but also quite a beautiful in the sense that I got to share his last moments with his mother. And I, that, I mean, insofar as a death can be beautiful, it, this, it sounds like how we would want to be surrounded by people that we love. And I had another guest on recently whose mother, a lady called Sasha, who, and her husband's mother sat and stroked his head as, as he as he left this this world. And I found that quite moving as a mother. You're a mother too. I think the, the side from the parent is it must be just awful to watch your child die in front of you that oh. you begin to imagine, can you? But very, right. very powerful that he was there and that you were generous enough to be able to share your the, end, the last minutes with your husband, with his mum, because... It also can get a bit kind of competitive over who gets to see people at the end. Really? And it, it's and it, like... it, it, really. We worked through it all. I think we did well as a family to really work through it. A lot of communication. But, yeah, there were points, you know, where it, that conflict between mother and wife, do you know what I mean? It's like, but it, it, we worked through all of it. And, you know, I think that, um, well, it's a credit to what a lovely family he has, you know, um, and his legacy, do you know what I mean? It was like, he, yeah, I think everyone was respectful. But yeah, and the hospice do help because they do kind of manage you through it. And yeah, we kind of, yeah, it was, but it, it was it was difficult. Because it, it's also like, you know, he got to the point where he was having to be fed, you know. So one time mm -hmm. I sort of came in and he's managed feeding him again. And it's just like, oh my God, this is like some kind of acid trip. You know, I have taken acid and... My whole world has been like turned like into some yeah. It was quite bizarre. That's quite a good analogy for widowhood, actually, isn't it? That you know, <laughs> as my drink wins fight because I'm fairly certain this is not the life I was living five minutes ago. Oh, Nico, I'm now. Obviously, the children were very aware that this was going to happen. They were not kept in the dark, which I I know and, and you'll be aware of is is kind of one of the most damaging things. Um, we don't tend to do it as much anymore, but, you know, friends of mine who had lost parents uh, young, one of the things they'd said is you must talk about it, you must kind of create this open dialogue. And so hearing you talk about the kind of open dialogue that you had with your children throughout Mark's illness um, is really kind of refreshing and, and um, reassuring because it is the advice that we're given, isn't it? It's that you keep talking and you involve them in, in not necessarily decision-making, but you, you, you involve them in what's going on. Now... As a result of that, they will have been very aware that um, death was imminent. But you've talked yourself about it still being a massive shock. How did the children react when you you had to kind of tell them that he had he'd gone? Yeah, I mean, I yeah. So I had to leave the hospice, and I'd said to everyone he was staying with his aunties um, at um, his Mark's mum's house, who lives locally. And uh, so I'd driven over and I sort of said, I really want to be the one to tell them. Um, so I went in and um, and sat them down and, and told them. And yeah, I mean, they were just, they just both, in the same way that it was a massive shock to me, um, it was a massive shock to them. And they just, you know, burst into tears. And it was, yeah, very, very emotional. And um, it was, yeah, awful. I think it's, I mean, I'd say it's partly one of the worst things I've had to say to them. I guess telling them originally that he had cancer was, again, pretty much up there with the worst conversation that I could have had, I, I guess. But, yeah, the telling them, yeah, it was awful. It was a really hard conversation. And, yeah, you know, seeing him in pain was really yeah. awful. It goes against everything that we do as mothers, doesn't it, you know, to protect them from harm and protect them from the big scary things that are out in the world. And suddenly you can't do that. You can't protect these babies from from this the awful, you know, the, one of the worst things that can happen to a child. Yeah, and so immediately after that, they'd laid him out at the hospice. So the whole family then went to the hospice, including the kids, and we sat oh, wow. with his body for probably about three hours, um, and all my family were visiting. And so there was probably about 20 of us, all in all, 
and we sat with him. And I think for the kids, although I, that was, it wasn't scary. They were so comfortable with how he looked. He looked so peaceful. And so, yeah, I think that in a way, I think it kind of, it did help in the long run with the kind of finality of it, maybe. Um, I think it did, in retrospect, freak them out oh, that they'd sat with his dead body because, you know, I'll, I'll often say to them, you know, don't do this or tell them off and he'll say, well, I've seen a dead body. Oh, uh, you know, like that's been you. And they're kind of like, you know, I've sat with a dead body. Nothing's going to shock me, you know. And you're like, yeah, oh. got four um, medals. But, um, but I do think you, you could see that that, that was, a, you know, a, quite a, a powerful thing and I guess maybe help with their kind of acceptance. I don't know. Maybe it's that in, kind of, yeah. It's important acceptance and to coin the, the American word closure. Uh, and it's the reason I held a memorial without a body, actually, because I needed, I needed it. And I knew very, very, or I believe very strongly that the children did. Uh, and it's something I'm glad I did. So, um, and what about going forward? Uh, how are they, how are they now? Because they are over five years into this themselves. And, I know we don't want to talk too much about your children because they're teenagers and they have respected privacy, but um, do you see uh, the impact still or do you think that um, they've managed to kind of process it through and it's just kind of part of who they are? Um, I would definitely say it's it's part of who they are. I It rears its head regularly because, you know, every award ceremony every success every you know every time it tends to come more when we're celebrating something I guess like you know that kind of he's not there and that kind of becomes you know my um, son has become a teenager so he really wants to know more about who he's revisiting who his father was at, not as a little boy but as a teenager and he sort of recently wanted to you know meet up with some of his old friends that have kind of told him stories and I've got these videos that we made where they were kind of split into age rough ages that we could show bits yeah. and he's seen a bit more about his kind of more wild days and you know so I guess um it, he's always there but I the resilience is amazing the strength the uh traumatic growth I mean you know, they are remarkable children. I, I have a lot of feedback from teachers saying how empathetic they are, how grown up they are, how, you know, when they're talking about um, sort of things at school that are quite emotional, um, you know, what a good insight on loss they have and insight. And so I think it's made them, you know, not, you know, I would rather it didn't, but it has made them extremely resilient um, and very emotionally rounded children. Sort of don't sweat the small stuff as well. They And they're pretty, um, you know, obviously you get this sort of people say stuff to them about their dad being dead. I mean, my son's had a few things over the years and it's like water off a duck's back now. Do you know what I mean? He really isn't. He's like, if that is all you've got for me, like, you know, just it's, amazing that kind of strength um so yeah I I think they both come out of it very um rounded people they probably I would have rather they'd come out of it without having to go through any of it but you know yeah I can relate to that and hearing you talk about the celebrations my youngest daughter it was six months when he died and she just you know performed in a dance show at the weekend and I didn't anticipate how heavy it was going to land until I kind of looked to the right and saw a very proud dad stood up applauding and just like that yeah. the sort of joy vanished I mean it, it came back very quickly but you just sort of go completely flat and think oh like she was a baby and now she's stood up at a stage as this confident little girl and it's not fair that he didn't get to see that and it's not fair that she doesn't get him right. there it's not fair any of them but I also agree with this idea that the children that we send out into the world they are empathetic and they are emotionally mature and they are incredibly resilient I wish to god they didn't have to be much like I wish I hadn't had to prove yeah. how brave I was but under pressure we sometimes we yeah it's interesting isn't it because you read things like Roald Dahl books and most of the characters have lost the parent you know so I suppose his 
Um, you know, yeah, now they're really hamming it up, aren't they? For the mm-hmm. I, and, and that's, I mean, there's some really awful ones, aren't they, where they're suddenly the, the father comes back as a snowman. We saw something like that. Over. Oh, that's my personal favourite, yes, when they come back from the dead. Yes, I love that one. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I guess, you know, obviously in the past, kids would have had to have dealt with all these things. And I suppose maybe it was talked about a little more, you know, because most of Roald Dahl's books, it's a child that has maybe one or only one parent for whatever reason through. So, yeah, it's... Um... And, Luca, I do like to ask this, but guests don't have to answer. Have you, um, have you have any romantic entanglement? Yes, so I have. I've been seeing someone for about, um, I think it's coming up to two and a half years now. So, yeah, I've had a, a boyfriend for two and a half years. Feels ridiculous saying boy our age, doesn't it? That's why I got married again. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yes, and that's been lovely. It's been really good. Um, Nice to have met someone. Um, He is not right. He doesn't live with me or anything. So he, but he gets on really well with the kids. Um, They see him more as a. I think they see him more as a friend. It's kind of more of that kind of relationship. Um, um, but yeah, it's nice. It's been really nice. We sort of had a few holidays all together and things like that. And uh, yeah, so I have. And I mean, I have found it difficult to sort of almost trust that you can, well, I guess, trust that he won't just die, basically. Um, I think on some level, it's quite difficult to, um, yeah, trust that things can actually just be okay and normal. It's um, terrifying. Which is terrifying yeah. opening up your heart. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I guess, the biggest challenge with that. Well, I, for one, am very glad that you've managed to find some happiness again. And I'm very glad that your children sound like they're absolutely thriving. And I think that's a really positive message for people out there. Perhaps people who are staring down the barrel of terminal illness or perhaps people who are more freshly widowed the kind of knowledge that actually your children can go on and thrive and this isn't necessarily going to be this completely defining moment that will change who they are beyond all recognition. They are going to be changed, but they are still the the child that they were and they can still go on and live a full and wonderful life. And I'm really pleased to hear that all three of you sound like you are doing that, which is really the most wonderful way to honour Mark's memory, isn't it? Yes, definitely. And my, both of them remind me of him so much at points. And my, you know, his, his humour's back. Yeah. You know, in my <laughs> So lovely. And my daughter, you know, like they will just make me laugh. And I suddenly say, oh, that's so Mark. Some yeah. of that is so Mark. So they do live on, you know, in this. Um, they do. So that's quite lovely. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. You've been very, very open and very honest and incredibly. Um, enlightening actually on some areas that I had no insight into despite having done I can't remember how many interviews I've on now <laughs> uh, so every single time I speak to somebody I learn something and I find out something about this person and I find out something about their lost person so it's also been really lovely to, to hear a little bit more about Mark and he did write a blog didn't he whilst he was going through cancer treatment so I yeah. will Link it when I when we release your episode as yeah. well. So and you also have made an album as well um, that it's on Bandcamp, which I could also, which is amazing. And strangely, he was making this album before he got diagnosed, but and it was about someone's brain, the whole thing. So and it's uh, that has done quite well as well. And it's yeah, it's on Bandcamp. I still get people buying it every now and then. Um, so yeah, He's he made a lot. Of- Was he yeah. a musician then? Yes, so that was part, partly what he did, yes. So he'd, he'd always made music and he was very into electronic music over the years. He was in quite a few bands and then he kind of like uh, gave up sort of touring and stuff to kind of do more of a kind of conventional job for quite a few years, but then continued to make electronic music and he was really, really getting back into it um, sort of around the time that he got diagnosed and, yeah, used the kind of momentum to make some amazing music. We even played his album at the church while people oh. were coming up, the, when he was coming up, um, coming into the church, you know. And, uh, yeah, so that's been a real, it's been a lovely thing to have. Um, him living on through his music and for 
you know, my son now makes electronic music as well, using all his equipment. So it's continuing. I was just going to say for your son and, and your daughter as well, the idea of having this legacy that's left behind and being able to hear something that he created, that's, that's very special. Yeah, definitely. Well, with that, I'm going to say goodbye, but thank you ever so much for this. I really do appreciate you coming on to talk to us, and I know that our listeners will be very grateful as well because what the story that you have told is is very, very powerful, and I know that doing this is, is not easy. It takes enormous strength to do it. But the one thing I can tell you is that everybody who's done it has come away feeling kind of empowered and um like a release has happened. So I, I very much hope you feel the same way and I wish you and, and the children much love and, and healing as you go forward with life. Thank you. Thank you for, for giving me the time. Thank you. Of course. And for everybody else, we will be back with you on Friday. So take care of yourselves and I'll speak to you then. Bye.